to contribute. As Lynn has said, our institute partnered with the Canadian Race Relations Foundation to conduct a national survey on the topic of race relations in this country, and in fact, the first such survey of its kind. What did we set out to address? Uh, the purpose, first, to generate credible, independent evidence on how Canadians think about and experience race relations and racism. Provide a catalyst or a point of common ground around which stakeholders from different parts of society can come together and engage on the topic and learn from each other. And finally, to provide some new information metrics to organizations in all sectors who are working to reduce racism, both internally and externally. So this is really what the research uh, is intended to do. Um, it is inspired, in fact, by re some research that's been going on in other countries, notably in both Australia and South Africa. There is an ongoing research program in each country uh, under the label Reconciliation Barometer that looks at relations between different parts of society in terms of how people get along and their attitudes and their experiences. Uh, this kind of research really should be done in this country as well, and uh, so that is uh, what we are trying to do. How do we do the research? Well, as Lynn indicated, this was a survey. We conducted the survey online with uh, roughly 3,100 Canadians, ages 18 and over, uh, earlier this spring. We wanted a representative sample of Canadians, and uh, so we took various measures to do that, and that involves in part stratifying sample of by province, age, gender, and self-identified racial background to make sure we have a good representation of each. Uh, so I've indicated that we uh, have representation from larger racial groups. We picked the four largest racial groups in the country based on population, Chinese, Black, South Asian, Indigenous people. And we took extra steps to what we call oversample these groups to make sure that they are rep well represented in our survey so that we could look at the results of the questions uh, by people from these groups. And uh, I should point out that uh, this is uh, by self-identification. Uh, people self-identified into one of these groups or into other groups uh, that uh, we did not oversample. What did we cover in this research? We covered a number of topics. The perceived state of race relations in Canada, how people feel that we're doing attitudes towards other racial groups, not their own, perceptions of racial discrimination in our society, treatment of one's own racial group, and finally, one's own personal experience with discrimination and racism. So that covers quite a bit. So, oh. what did we learn? <laughs> the survey had many questions. We have lots of results and data. But from all this, there are really three big conclusions that we believe emerge uh, from this study. And uh, what I'm going to do is present these three conclusions, and in each case then show you some of the data and results that would uh, uh, support it and lead us to, to what we conclude. So big conclusion number one. Probably a little surprise to most people, but the study does confirm the reality of racism in this country. A significant proportion of Canadians report experiences of discrimination due to race, at least occasionally, if not on a regular basis. Many say they witness such mistreatment of others, both people within the same with the same racial background as their own and those who are different. And such experiences cover a range of settings, most commonly in public and workplace, school, university, and stores and restaurants. So it happens in many, uh, many parts of our world. And finally, as we would expect, such experience varies very significantly across particular racial groups. Now, let's look at some of the data that led to this conclusion. <clears throat> Starting with uh, frequency of unfair treatment of one's own racial group. And here we're showing the results uh, across each of the each of a number of groups that are in our sample. So the, the responses, the results of people who identify as white, Chinese, South Asian, and so forth. And the scale of frequency is from often to occasionally to rarely to never to some who can answer the question or not. 
what we can see here is a pattern that is quite clear. There are significant differences, as we would expect, that uh, people from some groups are much more likely to believe that uh, there's discrimination against their own group. Most notably, Black and Indigenous respondents in Canada, we can see large majority say this happens at least occasionally, if not often. Somewhat less so for South Asian Chinese uh, and other people from other racialized groups. And finally, uh, those who identify as white, uh, significantly less, but even some people in this group identify this as well. Please note here that the other category are those people who identify uh, in some, uh, as a racialized person, but not one of the four largest groups. Uh, we simply did not have enough people in, from any particular group in that uh, segment of our sample to report on. But nevertheless, it's still relevant to, to show here. What about um, witnessing um, the discrimination of others due to race? This is not just a perception of what's happening, but uh, a perception of um, a, a witnessing treatment of other people, starting with the same race as, as your own. So as we can see, a significant number, particularly indigenous and black, large majority say that they have witnessed such treatment of people of their own race. Other 48% Chinese, 53 South Asian, 46, and even 26% uh, of people identify as white. And we should keep in mind that uh, people who identify as white, uh, that's a range of identities and backgrounds. Um, and in some cases, uh, uh, some groups who identify as white may experience uh, issues because of who they are. For instance, uh, people who are Jewish, uh, we know from one of our surveys, which fit this category. And of course, we might imagine that some people who identify as white might actually uh, be referring to what uh, sometimes referred to as reverse discrimination, and people who might insist that uh, well, they're discriminated against because they're not racialized. All right. Also, yes, thank you. All right. We also ask people whether they experience discrimination or racism against people from other races, people who have races other than their own. Um, and here we can also see that significant proportions uh, also say that they have seen this happen to people other than themselves. What about the impact of racism on people of their own race, uh, who they know, who they're close to? Is racism affecting them to a great extent, somewhat, only a little, not at all? Um, and again, we can see a very similar pattern. Uh, people who are indigenous and black, a large majority say to at least some extent, uh, racism is affecting people they know personally. Um, somewhat less so for South Asian, Chinese, and other. Uh, and a relatively small number of people who identify as white experience or report this. Moving to one's own personal experience, um, and this is their own experience with racial discrimination, um, showing the same groups. And we see, in fact, a very similar pattern, which is not at all surprising. Uh, most notably, indigenous and black Canadians are ones who are most likely to say from time to time, if not regularly, they experience discrimination or mistreatment because of their race. South Asian and Chinese, somewhat less so. Um, and a very small proportion of white Canadians keep the test they regularly, very small, 10% from time to time. If we look at the results of this question through the lens of other factors, uh, demographics, for instance, um, we don't actually see a lot of difference. Um, men are a little more likely than women to report discrimination. Uh, those who are 65 and over are much lower uh, than those who are younger. And perhaps a bit surprisingly, socioeconomic status, as defined by education and income, doesn't seem to really come into play in a significant degree, as we might expect. Um, so really, the differences in terms of discrimination are largely having to do with one's racial background. What about the settings which people report experiencing racial discrimination? We presented this list of settings that asked if they had experienced such mistreatment in any of them. And uh, what we could see is that uh, at the top of the list are on the street, workplace, 
of 38% in each case of 4 in 10. Uh, to somewhat less extent, but still notably in school or university, stores, restaurant, public transit, airports, uh, and so forth. So uh, a fairly wide range of settings in which people have experienced it. We also delved a bit deeper to get a sense of the ways in which people feel that this has happened to them. Um, one with such way is what are sometimes called day-to-day -day, uh, uh, forms of racism and microaggression. Uh, sort of smaller scale flights that can still uh, can still hurt. Uh, we asked about six of them. Uh, sh uh, listed over on the left, uh, others treated you as not smart, others acted as if they were suspicious of you, they ignored, overlooked in a restaurant, mistaken for someone else, and so forth. We asked whether this happened to you in the past 12 months. Recently. What we can see is that uh, all the cells are filled. Uh, not insignificant numbers identified these kinds of, of flights or microaggressions, but clearly it is the indigenous and black respondents most significantly who indicate this. A uh, majority of people who are black uh, identify not, say, others not treating them as smart or acting suspiciously. 60% um, of indigenous people on the second one. So notable numbers uh, identifying them uh, being unfairly stopped by police. 31% uh, of Indigenous respondents, um, so, um, but also reported somewhat by other groups. This is uh, one of the questions for which we have a bit of comparable data from the United States, which is sometimes interesting to look at because uh, they clearly have issues with uh, race relations in that country. The Pew Research Center in 2018, uh, some of the similar items and I'm showing this just to give you an indication that uh, a similar range of different uh, uh, shows with uh, black Americans by far most likely to experience some of these activities and white uh, Americans least likely. So uh, indigenous uh, persons are not included here, but we see Asian Hispanics, which are somewhere in between. We also asked those people who reported some experience some level of racial discrimination, the extent to which it has bothered them, it has impacted them. The results are actually fairly similar to what we found with a previous study we did with the black community in, in Toronto. Um, and I think what it shows is that uh, there's really a range of responses that, uh, that uh, people are indicating that people are affected uh, by racial discrimination to a, a different degree. Some people are bothered quite a bit and other people say it doesn't really bother them at all. Um, and uh, again, we could look at the pattern here. Uh, black respondents are most likely to say that it bothers them at least somewhat, if not a lot. South Asian indigenous about the same, other in Chinese a little bit more so, and, uh, and white respondents a bit less. <clears throat> so, <coughs> excuse me. So I think, you know, what the, what the insight here is that <clears throat> not everybody is affected the same way. Uh, certainly does not suggest that uh, it's any more justified, but uh, the people's response to it uh, can vary. And then finally, along this uh, uh, line, um, we ask people how much the extent to which they feel that their racial background and ethnicity has had an impact on their success in life. Has it made it harder for them to succeed, easier for them to succeed, or make no difference? A pattern here is very similar to the pattern we've seen with uh, the mother slides, but here uh, the black population really stands out. 50% say it's been harder for them to succeed, which is only 7% easier. South Asian and indigenous uh, are not quite the same, Chinese, other. And white, not surprisingly, as we would expect, very few uh, uh, white Canadians think their, their race or identity has made it more difficult. 30% um, uh, I think identify or acknowledge the advantage or privilege that they have based on who they are. Um, but also interesting that almost 6 in 10 believe it makes no difference. Uh, and I guess from their perspective, they probably believe that's the case. In terms of demographic factors, if you look at this through another lens, um, socioeconomic status, gender, and age really don't factor in nearly as significantly in explaining results to this particular question. 
Then one final question uh, along the scene. Uh, we asked people how often they consciously downplayed their race or culture um, and uh, by group responding. Um, and, um, and I think probably this isn't too surprising, but relatively few in any of these groups say they do so regularly. Um, these people are a little more likely to say they do it from time to time. Most say very rarely or never. And uh, I, I think this, this pattern makes good sense. I think that uh, part of the challenge for many people who are racialized is that uh, because of skin color and appearance, it's difficult but not impossible to downplay uh, their racial background. Indigenous peoples, uh, it's a little different uh, because uh, many Indigenous peoples do not necessarily present clearly as such, um, and it would give them an opportunity if they so chose. Let's move now to the second big conclusion. <coughs> the second conclusion, big conclusion is that the prevalence of racism in Canada is widely, if not universally, recognized by Canadians. <coughs> what do we mean by this? <coughs> the large majority of Canadians across the population acknowledge that some in their country experience discrimination, racism, unfair treatment. And includes somewhat, but not much smaller majority of non racialized rural Canadians. So they're certainly not oblivious. People across all racial groups tend to see racism more as a function of individual attitudes and prejudice and systemic discrimination, but there's some acknowledgement that the latter also exists. And uh, the pattern is fairly clear across the population overall, Indigenous people are most widely seen racial discrimination, followed by Black and South Asian people, relatively few by comparison described as Canadian. So let's look at some of the data behind this big conclusion. Started by asking what we call an open-ended for unprompted questions. And we asked people to identify what racial groups in, in Canada are most frequently targeted for discrimination. And this slide is quite interesting because uh, uh, there's no group that uh, uh, predominates. Uh, uh, Aboriginal or First Nations people mentioned by 23%, Africans are Blacks, 15, Muslims, 15, and so forth. Um, and 39%, 4 in 10, can't even identify any. So that's actually a bit of surprise given the conclusion that I just gave you. But I think it's partly a function of uh, the nature of the question. We didn't give people groups to respond to, so this was kind of top of mind. But what it does suggest is that uh, not everyone uh, 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 necessarily sees all the different groups. It's notable that uh, uh, people, uh, uh, respondents, are most are the ones most likely to identify their own group, 39% uh, of Indigenous people. 44% of Africans are Blacks, and so forth. Um, but still, you can see that these are, are not significantly higher. They're not a majority. So what it does suggest, perhaps uh, counterintuitively, is that not everybody in these groups necessarily believes their group is one of the ones most frequently targeted. And it also it clearly shows that uh, regardless of one's own racial background, you can, people are aware of discrimination against groups other than their so an interesting, uh, <clears throat> interesting case. So we asked, <coughs> we asked a, a more straightforward question about the perceived frequency of discrimination for the specific racial groups. So we actually presented the groups, <coughs> and people were able to respond. So as I indicated in the big conclusion, <coughs> Canadians are most likely to see Indigenous peoples in this country as being often or occasionally the victim of racism, followed by Black people and South Asians and much less so Chinese people. <clears throat> and I will point out, just to be clear, that uh, respondents were actually not asked to rate their own racial group here, um, because we asked about that in a different question. People, when we asked about the basis of discrimination, tend to think it's more about the prejudice of individuals than something that's built into the laws and institutions of the land. Uh, about a Three and ten believe that both are equally a problem. That's a sort of volunteer response. And uh, smaller proportions either uh, uh, don't think discrimination happens against groups, specific groups, or it cannot say. Um, and we're showing on this table the results of the basis 
uh, as applied to each of these specific groups. You can see that there are some differences. Uh, people are most likely to believe that indigenous people uh, are both prejudiced and built into the laws and institutions, uh, prejudice of individuals, higher for black, and so forth. Not dramatic differences, but there are some, uh, some factors here. Uh, it is probably also worth pointing out that younger Canadians are more likely to be aware of the systemic uh, racism happening against people compared to older. We also asked a question about the treatment of particular groups compared with white people in a number of settings. So if this is really a measure of institutional racism, uh, whether people are treated less fairly in, in certain situations because of the situation in the institution. It is interesting that uh, uh, there's quite a range here. 52% uh, uh, of Canadians believe that uh, people from specific racial groups are treated the same as white people in healthcare services. Less so for stores and restaurants, and there's a sound uh, when you get to dealing with police, only 31% believe they're treated the same, but 40% uh, uh, really can't say either way. So what this suggests is that if you look at the pink bars, uh, a, a, a portion, a, a significant minority of Canadians believe that uh, specific racial groups are treated less fairly in these situations, but it's uh, uh, clearly only a minority. Go a little bit deeper and look at results of these questions by specific racial groups, because that's how we asked. Um, you can see that there are some differences. So, for instance, when receiving healthcare services, Indigenous people are more likely to be seen as treated less fairly than white compared to Black, South Asian, and Chinese, um, and, uh, and so forth. And looking down the list when dealing with police, uh, again, we can see that there are big distinctions that uh, the majority of Canadians believe that Black and Indigenous people are treated less fairly in these situations, uh, and Chinese people are uh, much less likely to be the case. Okay. <clears throat> so let's switch, uh, switch tack a little bit, uh, and I want to uh, turn now to uh, Canadians' attitudes towards specific groups. <laughs> This is through a set of statements, agree, disagree statements. This actually is uh, 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 the way in which we actually looked at, uh, at racism through attitudes of specific groups, but doing it in a way that was not uh, uh, particularly explicit and asking people whether they liked or didn't like certain groups or felt that they were uh, inferior in particular ways, uh, often those sort of measures of racism. Um, this is actually fits under a concept that's known uh, today as modern racism, which I will come back to a little later. Um, but uh, let me take you through these results and, uh, and give you an indication of uh, how Canadians, what their perceptions are of, of particular groups in society. So uh, we asked people whether they agreed or disagreed with the statement that discrimination against a particular group is no longer a problem in Canada. And the group in question was either Chinese, South Asian, or black. Here we can see the results. And there's a de definite pattern here. Uh, Canadians are least likely to believe this is the case when it applies to Indigenous people, only 23% agreed. 47% uh, uh, however agreed that it applied to black people, 54% uh, for South Asians and 63% for Chinese. So uh, clearly uh, people are uh, reacting differently to whether discrimination is an issue against certain groups. Again, I'll point out in these questions that we did not ask people uh, to rate their own, their own racial group, as that, uh, that didn't make sense. Another agree-disagree statement, it is easy to understand the anger of a particular group in Canada today. And here again, it's Indigenous people who stand out, uh, a clear majority of Canadians agree with that question. They do say it's easy to understand the anger. Uh, and much less so, but not, uh, not dramatically so necessarily in the case of Chinese and South Asians, where uh, it's about a third or so, but uh, still exists. And yet another statement, I want to look at this from different angles. Over the past few years, a particular group has gotten more economically than they deserve. Uh, and here it's interesting that Indigenous people uh, is the group that's where there's most likely the agreement, but it's only 30% versus 52% uh, who disagree. Um, 
But even though indigenous people are seen to be discriminated against the most, uh, there is also some sense that perhaps they've gotten a bit more than they deserve by some people. Government and news media have shown more respect to a particular group than they deserve. A very similar pattern to the previous question, but just to give you another, <clears throat> another way to look at it. And finally, do you agree or disagree that racial discrimination is the main reason why Indigenous groups do not get ahead? Uh, it's interesting here that, uh, in, again, Indigenous people, Black people, stand out a bit compared to South Asian and Chinese. But even for these two groups, opinion is really evenly divided for the most part between people who agree and disagree. So certainly no public consensus about this particular issue. Uh, and I do have one more here. Uh, agree or disagree, I, I would have no problem accepting someone who is from one of these groups as a neighbor. Um, and um, again, almost everyone agrees, uh, the majority say strongly agree, that they would not have an issue with this. Now, <laughs> So one might wonder, are people being honest in their assessment uh, of this? Uh, my interpretation is uh, I think they probably are, uh, based on some other results in the survey. Um, and I will also point out that because this is an online survey, uh, people probably feel relatively free at some level to express their opinion. So this does suggest that, uh, uh, you know, despite other issues, uh, people would not necessarily have an issue with this kind of contact. And finally, a statement that was asked in broad terms, not about a particular group. Do you agree or disagree that Canada would be a better place if ethnic and racial groups maintain their cultural identity? So you can see in most groups, a majority uh, agree with the statement. Uh, it's interesting the two groups that stand out as being less likely to agree are those who identify as white and who are Métis. In this particular question, we broke out the results for First Nations and Métis, and you can see there is, is quite a difference. Um, and, uh, and that's interesting to, to ponder. So, <laughs> I mentioned the concept of modern racism. Uh, what we did with these agree disagree statements is put the data together to form a what we call an index. Um, Modern racism uh, is, is a term that was developed in the U.S. a number of decades ago, um, and it was defined uh, uh, by these researchers as a more subtle form of racism, focusing on racialized people as a group rather than individuals, and on their place in society rather than their individual characteristics. Uh, so it's really sort of a different type of, of racist or racial attitude um, that, uh, I guess, might be considered more socially acceptable or uh, 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 something that one is, is able to express uh, like the, the older form. So we thought this might be useful to get at. So we took the results of those different agreed disagree statements and created an index um, that uh, uh, we thought might be useful. And uh, on a scale from 0 to 100, and we've been broken into three groups, low, medium, and high, uh, based on results. Um, and what we can see is that uh, a very small percentage, about one in ten um, Canadians, fit into the high modern racism index. So uh, that's a relatively small group. Uh, for, and then the other, the rest uh, fall equally between low and medium. <clears throat> so there's a bit of an arbitrariness to the scale, but it's a useful way to make comparisons uh, across groups. Here are the results across age cohorts. <coughs> showing the mean and the, uh, uh, the breakdown across the three groups. What we can see is that there is a somewhat modest difference across age groups, and older Canadians um, are a little more likely to be higher on this index than younger Canadians. And that's something that uh, is consistent with other research we've done and something we might expect. What's more interesting, perhaps, is to look at this index across racial groups itself. <laughs> Here's a table that looks a bit complicated, but let me take you through it. <coughs> and um, so this is the index, the zero to 100 index, um, and down, down the, um, uh, uh, down from top to bottom are the uh, the groups in terms of uh, our respondents on the survey, and across the top are the groups that are being assessed. And uh, we, of course, are not asking people to, we're not asking people about their own racial groups. 
So if we look down the down the page, we start with white Canadians, Chinese, and so forth. We can see uh, uh, the extent to which there is sort of a modern racism sentiment expressed against Chinese, South Asian, Indigenous, and so forth, and their total. If we look at the column all the way to the right, we can see that uh, there's a there's a bit of a range of of, of index scores uh, across these different racial groups, from uh, a high of 43.4. Indigenous to a low of 37.1 uh, uh, among black respondents. I think the first thing to say is this is a fairly narrow range uh, of difference. It's only a few points from high to low. So there aren't big differences in the rate and the attitudes expressed by different groups of Canadians, which is, which is interesting and perhaps a bit surprising. Um, and we can see that white Canadians are a little higher than the average, but just barely, 42.1 versus 41. Uh, black uh, uh, Canadians are the lowest, and so forth. So if we look across the page, <clears throat> these are the, the groups in terms of how they're appraised. And here we see a bit more of a difference. You can see here that uh, the modern racism index is lowest for Indigenous people, uh, 36.6, and it reflects the fact that they are most likely to be seen as victims of racism in society. At the higher end are Chinese and South Asians, uh, largely because they don't tend to be seen as being victims of racism, and therefore uh, their place in society is seen to be uh, uh, perhaps uh, better than uh, slightly than they deserve in some way. So it, it's interesting measures. Um, I think we need to be careful about putting too much significance. But I think that uh, one of the major, uh, uh, I think, insights or conclusions here is that uh, uh, attitudes about race and racial sentiments are by no means limited strictly to non-racialized people. That racialized uh, uh, people also have sentiments, uh, positive or negative, towards a particular group. Um, and I think it's useful to put, be able to put some uh, some data to that. Let me turn now to the third and final big conclusion. <clears throat> the reality of racism and the recognition that exists in our society notwithstanding, I think it's also interesting that we are concluding that racism is not seen as a major fault line in the, in the Canadian society today. What do we mean by this? What we found is that Canadians and across all racial groups uh, believe that people from different races generally get along and to a bit lesser extent have equal opportunities most Canadians interact with people from different racial backgrounds, and in many cases, it's a friendship. And again, maybe a bit surprising to some people, people are more likely to be optimistic than pessimistic about progress towards racial equality happening in their lifetime. And this perspective is not completely, but largely shared across racial groups. And finally, Canadians' perspective and experience is noticeably more positive than that expressed by Americans. That may be a low bar to compare ourselves with, but nevertheless, one uh, uh, worth noting. We asked the question in the survey, how well people from different races tell you? Here are the results. 71% <clears throat> said generally good, 17% bad, and 12 cannot say. What's interesting is that the generally good number is largely similar across all of the racial groups we looked at among South Asians at 81 percent, and the only group that's somewhat lower is Indigenous peoples at 56 percent, but that's still the majority. We also asked people how they believe uh, race relations in this sense uh, are today compared to 10 years ago. Uh, no consensus there, 32 percent improved, 24 percent worsened, 39 percent about the same, five cannot say. Again, however, the responses to this question are not dramatically different uh, across racial groups. Again, indigenous peoples are the most likely to say things have gotten worse, 30 percent. Uh, but again, that's only three in ten. We asked a follow-up question. Those people who felt that uh, race relations have changed wanted to know why or how they thought it's improved or gotten worse. These were, this was an open-ended question, and what I'm showing you in this table are the sort of the main themes that emerged from what people wrote on the survey. 
why race relations are how it's improved. Most people talk about most more openness, acceptance, greater diversity, more interaction, education initiatives, other reasons. And a third of them really couldn't pin it to anything in particular, but it was their sense. How has it worsened the quarter of people who feel it got worse, uh, more discrimination, racism, or tolerance? Uh, some people blame it on too many immigrants or lack of integration. Others believe it's around populism, right wing ideology, and so forth. Uh, and again, some people couldn't answer. So it gives us a bit of insight into where people are coming from on this particular question. We asked a similar question about how race relations is in Canada, not in terms of how people get along, but the, the extent to which people from all races have an equal chance to succeed in life. So a different kind of question. The results here are similar, not quite as positive, but not dramatically different. 4% believe it's generally good, 23% generally bad, 14% cannot say. Again, results are similar across racial groups, uh, although not the same. Again, South Asians, Chinese, it's about 7 in 10. Indigenous people, it's only 48%, so it's really noticeably different there. And black people, 55%. So there are some differences, but in each case, except for indigenous, it's still a majority. What about uh, changing changes here over the last 10 years? Again, uh, uh, no consensus. 34% improved, 18% worse, um, and 41% about the same. Again, it's really only the indigenous respondents who stand out here, where 29% say it's gotten worse. <clears throat> We also asked these two questions uh, about race relations in their own community. The previous ones, like this one, were about in Canada. But we ask about race relations in their own community. Uh, the results are even more positive. 81% describe them as generally good in terms of people getting along. 75% usually good in terms of generally good in terms of having equal chance to succeed. Um, so even more strongly when you get local, um, for indigenous people. Uh, getting along at 69%, black people 77%. So uh, across racial groups, there are not dramatic differences in responses to this question. Part of the reason for these positive results is the fact that in many, for many Canadians, there is uh, ongoing interaction with people from different races. 39% of Canadians say they have a lot of contact with people from racial backgrounds, different from their own, 36% some contact. Only 4% uh, have none at all. Those most likely to have such contact are younger, under 30, uh, living in cities rather than smaller towns, and interestingly, those with higher levels of education and income. If we asked about the nature of these interactions, how friendly they were, um, and 53% said very friendly, 36% somewhat, um, only 1% characterized these as as unfriendly, um, and uh, so it suggests that by and large, uh, uh, people's interactions with people from other races are are more positive than negative, not entirely so. Where in the country, where the population is the very friendly response most noticeable? It's interesting in Atlanta, Canada, and among South Asians, among Métis respondents, and those with the most education and income. Where does this response somewhat less noticeable? Among Chinese Canadians, 42%, First Nations, 37%, and those who live in Quebec, 45%. Not dramatically lower, but, uh, but some, some differences that uh, do emerge. I mentioned friendships. Uh, a large majority of Canadians have one or more friends from a range of groups other than their own. A bit lower among white, but it's still three quarters. But Chinese and South Asian, 91%, Indigenous, 86 Black, 92 other 93 It's interesting that, uh, that there are friendships, and I think that probably helps explain some of the other results to this conclusion. Looking to the future, how optimistic or pessimistic are people that uh, race, all racialized people in Canada will be treated with respect in their lifetime? Among all Canadians, 14% uh, very optimistic, 46% somewhat, uh, and then 26% somewhat very pessimistic. So by more than a two to one margin, people are optimistic rather than pessimistic. 
And I think most notably, if we look at this across the racial background of our respondents, we see, in essence, relatively few differences. Yes, South Asians are most optimistic on this one, and uh, uh, Chinese white are actually a little bit less so than others. Chinese and white are very optimistic. But I think what's important when you look at this picture is you would not really draw a different conclusion based on the particular group that you're looking at. We asked people from uh, uh, racialized groups about the next generation if they're a racial group and how they will experience racism in the future. Will this next generation face more racism, less, or about the same? And again, we don't see dramatic difference across racial groups. A small proportion believe the next generation of their group will face more racism, but a plurality, in every case, the dark green part of the bar, believes they will face less. So it's a fairly similar uh, 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 factor. Um, it is noticeable that if you look across these groups, that younger Canadians, younger racialized Canadians, are somewhat less positive than older ones. They're the ones who perhaps are feeling this uh, uh, most strongly. Uh, and then the final uh, set of conclusions I'd like to show you are about how uh, how we compare with the United States, a country where race has been such a, a a divisive thread without its history. First, we ask Canadians, how would they describe race relations in Canada compared with the United States? Not much surprise, two thirds believe it's generally better, 9% worse, 19% about the same. Um, and uh, uh, fairly similar across the population. I think the most negative uh, responses come either from indigenous respondents, where only 56% say better. Uh, and those with most Canadians without a high school education are the most negative, only 42% believe that the better versus 19% say worse. So this uh, interesting finding, I think perhaps uh, does this suggest just a sense of superiority or a bit of smugness um, that we think we're better and that perhaps we aren't. Uh, we know that uh, some people in, in racialized groups have uh, uh, made the, the statement that they think racism is actually worse, <clears throat> worse in this country uh, for various reasons. Um, so it's interesting to actually look at what Americans themselves say about racism in their country. If you we compare our results, the green bars, with results from the Pew Research Center earlier this year on uh, the same survey question. And what we can see is that, in fact, Americans are, are much more, less are much more negative about race relations in their own country than Canadians are about theirs. Uh, only 41% say good versus 58% bad. Significantly, a majority of Americans, 53%, uh, believe that uh, it's getting worse uh, versus 17% getting better. So there really is a very uh, sharp difference in perspective. Uh, I don't have this on the slide, but um, uh, but the numbers for compared with 10 years ago today or 2019 are much different than in 2012. Uh, if you go back to 2012, a majority of Americans at that point actually thought race relations there were getting better. So there's been a dramatic decline in views about this in the United States, which is very tragic. And finally, one more slide with U.S. data from another survey conducted in 2017 across different racial groups in the country and asking people from different groups whether they believe racial discrimination happens against their group. 92% of Black Americans, 78% of Latinos, 75% of Native Americans, 61% of Asian Americans, 55% of White Americans all believe that this takes place, and those are fairly significant numbers. <clears throat> so, <laughs> Let me wrap up. Um, uh, we've covered quite a bit of data. Let me just finish uh, with a couple of things, uh, starting with <clears throat> just quickly, quick review of our three big conclusions. Our first conclusion was that the study findings confirmed the reality of racism in Canada for a uh, number of reasons, which is true. Second big conclusion was that the prevalence of racism is widely, if not universally, recognized by Canadians. And uh, I think this one's a little more counterintuitive 
uh, because I think sometimes the notion is put out there that uh, Canadians are colorblind or, or most Canadians and non racialized Canadians don't. Just finally, uh, the fact that while racism certainly is part of the Canadian reality, it's not seen as a major fault line in the sense that um, people generally believe that race relations and how people get along, despite the problems and issues, is more positive than negative. Um, and there is hope for the future. So let me just finish up with a few details about the study. Uh, uh, our institute and the Race Relations Foundation publicly released the study last week um, with considerable media attention, uh, with the Globe Mail, sorry, with CBC and others. Um, we now have a full report and detailed data tables on this study, which is available on our website and can easily be found through the Race Relations Foundation website. Those of you who may be interested in further analysis of the data, we welcome this and uh, you can get this data file from us on request. Now that the study is underway, uh, we are reaching out to governments and other organizations to promote engagement with the research so that they understand it and, and start thinking about uh, how they may want to use it. And in fact, we'd like to see them do that. And finally, uh, our organizations will be available for presentations and briefings upon request, because uh, we want to spread the word and make sure that uh, the study and its insights um, are, uh, are understood and used to the advantage. With that, I will conclude my presentation and look forward to your questions and comments. And Len, over to you. Thank, thank you very much, Keith. And, uh, and thanks very much for uh, reserving your last uh, card uh, for letting people know how they can get more information because uh, this is a lot to digest and, uh, and it's very, it's worth the time to sit down with the information with a knife and a fork. So, so thank you for that. So we do have some questions uh, from our audience, but we would encourage uh, other participants uh, to take some time to type your questions and we will get them to Keith uh, as they arrive. So the first question, Keith, is uh, I suppose an administrative one. Uh, one of our participants wanted to know how the survey was funded or uh, who commissioned it or how it was commissioned. <coughs> That's a very good question, Len, and, uh, and thank you for asking. Uh, perhaps we should have mentioned that. Uh, this project was uh, self-funded by the Canadian Race Relations Foundation and the Enbrock Institute. Um, we, uh, we do our own research. We do not do this on behalf of other organizations. And uh, both of us thought that it was important enough to invest in this to, uh, 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 to make it happen. Uh, I will say that uh, the bank, RBC, provided some funding for the launch in Toronto last week, and we appreciate their funding. Uh, but their funding was simply to cover expenses for that launch. Excellent. Th thank you very much for that. Uh, another question that's just come in. Uh, did your survey find strong or significant variations overall among those who lived in rural, suburban, uh, or rural or suburban, or I suppose urban settings? Uh, interesting question. Um, the, uh, the study as we designed it did not take a, lar uh, a focus on looking at community size per se. Um, it was not one of the uh, primary uh, dimensions that we focused on. And it was not uh, possible with our sample necessarily to, to do that, to do justice to that. Um, we do have some measures in our data tables that compare sort of urban and non-urban um, or, or the major cities and the smaller cities and towns um, in our data. Um, by and large, I would say that from those measures, uh, there aren't really significant differences per se. Um, there are some regional differences that pop out of the numbers, but those regional differences largely reflect the racial composition of different parts of the country. Yeah. So just to pick up on that, so one of the... Um of course, with Bill 21, you know, uh, the distinct nature of Quebec society uh, is very much in, in, on everybody's uh, windshield at the moment. Um, did you notice any places in your uh, study where responses from Quebec stood out in a way that could be attributed 
uh, to this whole notion of the Societe du Um, Yeah, another really good question. Thank you. Um, the answer is no. Uh, if you look at the results on most of the questions um, uh, across uh, across regions, and certainly Quebec is well represented, um, you don't get a different set of conclusions. Um, Quebec does not really stand out. Um, again, one might imagine that's the case. Uh, certainly, uh, Bill 21 and some of the other issues in that province, I think, are, are probably more uh, centered around religion than race. Um, and I think that that uh, those are distinct, uh, uh, distinct issues uh, for people in Quebec in a way that uh, they're not in other parts of the country. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, having gone through all of this data. Uh, what, if anything, surprised you in the findings? Uh, what do you think would have been perhaps the most surprising to Canadians uh, who, are, uh, who, are, who are reading about this study? Good question, Lynn. Um, I think that the, uh, certainly the, the results on the reality of racism were no surprise. Um, I think we had seen that in other, some other studies, and I think we would have expected to see that. <coughs> Um, and perhaps not surprising that Indigenous people are most widely uh, 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 seen to be uh, uh, seen to be discriminated against because of all the attention uh, given uh, because of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and many of the other issues facing Indigenous peoples across the country. Um, I think perhaps what is surprising is that the, uh, the perspectives of people from different racialized groups was not larger than it might have been. I think we could have or might have seen a different set of results in which we would have seen much more of a gap between the perspectives of racialized and non-racialized Canadians. Um, certainly, we see that's what one sees in the United States. And we're not seeing that at nearly as much as we might have expected. On many of the slides that I showed, we could see that the differences across the results across racial groups were, were present but not very large. And I think this is most surprising when we ask about current race relations and optimism for the future. Uh, again, that, that racialized Canadians from various groups are not completely as optimistic as those of people who are not. The, um, you, know, you made reference in your response now to uh to the United States and that occupy and comparisons with the US occupied the last portion of your presentation. So you indicated, although this information wasn't on the slide, uh, that 2012 there was an uptick compared to 2009 and 2019. We of course have gone, uh, things have gone, look like they've gone down uh, significantly. Uh, it's always dangerous, I suppose, to try and, uh, you know, <laughs> compare, compare the, uh, or build trends when you don't have enough data. But what sticks in one's mind is 2012, that was during the Obama era, and currently we're not in the Obama era. So is the, are, the, are we looking at correlation or causation here? Well, <coughs> yes, I mean, uh, you know, we, the, the data doesn't, in and of itself doesn't, uh, <coughs> uh, uh, confirm uh, causation, but I think it's quite clear that uh, uh, in many ways, uh, American society is much more polarized now than it was in 2012. Uh, I think uh, certainly when Obama was in the White House, there was much more optimism about race relations. Um, as you may remember, when he was elected, uh, people started talking about a post-racial society, which certainly didn't exist. but. Uh, but the issue was quite different than it is today. And so I think that it's probably pretty clear, and I imagine most U.S. commentators would agree, that many social issues in the United States in 2019 are much more uh, negative and people are concerned compared to, uh, to 2012. Uh, it's a different time, a different administration. I think uh, not only are people polarized, but it seems apparent that people on both sides of the divide are equally unhappy, but they're unhappy about different things. Uh, that might be a definition of, uh, of, general, hap of general social happiness. Everybody's equally unhappy. 
<laughs> I'm not sure they would agree. <laughs> no, they probably disagree with each other. Uh, so, so in the midst of all this, you know, one que one question, uh, one uh, question I suppose that sometimes needs to be asked is about the questions themselves. I mean, the responses that you uh, that you get to your survey, and the responses that anybody gets to their survey are very much dependent on the questions you ask and how you ask them. So, just to go under the covers a little bit, uh, how do um, how do you guys decide? what questions are going to be asked and, and how they're going to be asked? Great question. Uh, <coughs> um, well, it's a, 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 from various sources, I think that uh, a, a small number of questions on the survey were drawn from other surveys, um, surveys that we may have asked uh, or done, and other surveys. So for instance, some of the questions in the, from the US PETA survey uh, were drawn because it's useful to draw from previous research, particularly when comparisons could be made. As I've said, however, um, there's been no such comprehensive survey of race relations in Canada done before. So we really, in many ways, were starting from scratch. Um, so we, uh, I think we understood what some of the issues were from some of our previous research and the literature. Uh, we did consult with uh, a, a few people who were experts or had background. Uh, uh, Professor Jeffrey Wrights from the University of Toronto, for instance, has been uh, doing research and writing on this for many years. Uh, he was an advisor to the project, and he was the one that uh, suggested that we needed to look at race relations, both from the perspective of how people get along and the equal opportunities to succeed. So we got input from a number of sources. Um, but really, uh, uh, you know, came up with the topic and tried to look at race relations from different perspectives, from broad perceptions to one's own attitudes about different racial groups, to perceptions of racial discrimination to one's own experience. I think those categories are probably somewhat self-evident, and then it was a question of coming up with research questions which were balanced and would also apply to all racial groups equally. In terms of the responses you get, and I know I cannot remember the, the author, but he, you know, he was writing. He was a, a former Google scientist, and he wrote a, the book. I think was called Everybody Lies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, to what extent are you able to uh, to correct or compensate for uh, socially desirable answers? <laughs> Uh, I suppose, uh, in terms of the data you're gathering, is it gathered uh, online, or are, do uh, researchers call and make appointments and actually speak to people through their questionnaires? Um, you know, that's a really good question. Um, you know, <laughs> we can't tell if people are lying. I mean, uh, and sometimes people can't tell if they themselves are telling what they really believe. Um, but a couple of things. First, uh, the survey was done online. Um, there are various reasons for that, but for this particular survey, that was particularly useful because there's less social desirability when, when you're completing a survey uh, through a machine than when you're interacting with a live individual, whether in person or on telephone, where there may be social norms and you may feel that you have to say certain things or can't say other things. When you're completing a survey online, there is research to show that people are uh, more likely to give uh, socially undesirable responses. And I think on a topic like race relations, we want to encourage people to be as honest as possible. So that's, so clearly we use the methodology that would uh, reduce social desirability. Um, whether people articulated their, their deepest, well, first, uh, some of these questions were about perceptions perceptions about what they think is taking place or not. Probably not a lot of social desirability around that. Whether people uh, experience discrimination or not, um, I think people uh, probably would be likely to express what they really felt about that. Um, in terms of other attitudes, um, I think there's an important distinction to be made between them, actually between one's, one's innermost feelings and what one feels uh, one needs to say when asked even on a survey. Um, and the latter is really around social norms. In other words, what is acceptable to articulate or not, even if it's uh, anonymous like a survey like this. Um, and I would suggest, 
that in some ways uh, the, the, the normative responses on a survey are actually more important than the innermost feelings. Um, because people may be feeling conflicted or having some uh, negative energy towards a particular group or issue. But if they feel that they that's not acceptable, and that in, in society, in public, uh, in interacting with other people, one needs to, to uh, present something a bit differently or act a bit differently, I would argue that that's actually more important. Because how we get along in society is ultimately what's important. And regardless of what people may feel internally, um, those social norms are actually the glue that keeps this uh, society together. And, what, and measuring those norms is ultimately more important than sort of the innermost feelings, which may or may not get expressed. No, I, I suppose that's true. I mean, people, people can think, uh, can think and feel uh, how they wish, but society runs on the basis of how people act and behave. Uh, when you mentioned uh, you know, during the Obama era, people were saying that uh, we may be in a post-racial society. Uh, I also recall in that same book about an Google Analytics uh, that they indicated that Google searches for uh, jokes, for what I would call N jokes, right, or Google searches about N in the White House uh, reached a historic high. So while people were talking about uh, entering the promised land, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in terms of how people really felt, there was some indication that really we weren't in the promised land, but we were in Death Valley. Um, one of the questions that popped up has to do, I suppose, with methodology, and that is, so now that the survey has been done, or after the survey was done and before the results were released, uh, is there any uh, uh, post, uh, post analytic analysis you do, do you, you kind of triangulate uh, your study against others that have been done to see, you know, to see if, it, if, it, if it's accurate or if it rings true or if it falls within the range of uh, the range of possible answers? Um, interesting question. Um, first off, this really was the first study of this kind to be done in this country. Uh, so limited opportunity to compare it to other, other uh, measures uh, in this country in, in a systematic way. Um, Unlike many other topics that we have studied, like immigration, where we have multiple surveys over time, this was really a first. Um, as I said earlier, we had done some specific studies with particular groups, uh, indigenous, urban indigenous people, uh, people in the black community in Toronto, where there might have been a few similar questions. Um, and certainly we could make those comparisons and the results were largely, uh, uh, you know, largely consistent. Um, so that suggested that, uh, that was, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're consistent. Um, you know, it's interesting, there really is no other independent evidence per se that we could point to um, that would be in roughly the same time period measuring roughly the same thing. So it's, uh, uh, there's no basis to validate it in a particular sense. I think that um, it's interesting. I think that one of the things that that Guess or reveals is that there's a real gap in in um, data and secondary measures and actual objective measures, if you will, of of, ex of race experiences of racism. So it's not really documented that well. Um, Stats Canada does has done some surveys in past years to provide some data, but that's now dated. So uh, there really isn't much opportunity to validate in, in a particular way and. Um, I think one of the things that we uh, intend to do over time is every three or four years or so repeat this kind of survey so that uh, not only can we uh, uh, sort of check the reliability, but we can measure uh, the evolution of race relations and see if it's getting better or worse. Okay. Well, you know, you talk about future research, and that's actually one of the questions that popped up. Um, <laughs> this is a bit of a two-parter. Uh, <laughs> In one of your slides, you talk about the relationship or the, or the responses or the feelings that people have about their interactions with law enforcement, with police. Um, the questionnaire was wondering if you had any insights into racism in the justice uh, sector. Jim, I guess more broadly. Yeah, uh, good question. We, 
Um, we didn't have any more specific questions on that. I think that uh, as you can uh, as you can see, we asked quite a lot of questions and covered a lot of ground. Um, but it was more breadth than depth. Um, really, weren't opportunities to dive much uh, deeper, other than the ones. So, for instance, we did ask about experience with the courts and police. Um, but it is <clears throat> here's one of the things uh, that I'd like to. Uh, to, to, to point out, in addition to our intention to repeat a survey like this every three or four years, we would like to encourage other organizations, whether governments or nonprofits or whatever, to uh, uh, to take some of our questions and do their own research with it. Um, because I think that what we have established here are a set of metrics uh, or, or indicators that we will measure, and we've provided a bit of a benchmark. But it would be great to see uh, local municipalities or uh, organizations to maybe repeat some of these questions, if not the whole survey, um, within their own populations to see how those results come out and perhaps even go deeper on topics uh, such as the justice sector so that our research is a bit of a starting point for a lot of other research in this topic that would be done by others. Okay. Well, that, Keith, thank you very much for that. And actually, uh, your answer anticipated a couple of the questions we uh, we, we had to uh, or wanted to cover, uh, which was, of course, where we go from here. You know, what should be done with this research and by who? Um, so, folks, we still have we've come to the end of the number of questions uh, in our hopper. Uh, we still have a few minutes left. So, uh, while we're waiting to see if anyone else has another question to offer, Keith. Uh, I just want to tell folks that uh, we have made a recording of this uh, of this webinar, and it will be available on our website uh, certainly by tomorrow. Uh, and Keith has already provided folks with uh, information about how to get more data from him ab about the survey. Um, and with that, Keith, uh, thank you so much. Any last words of wisdom for the uh, for folks on the call? Um, I'd just like to respond to a comment that showed up in the chat about uh, unconscious bias. Uh, how do we get around uh, people who don't think they're racist uh, but are? Um, my only comment is that uh, we're, we're, we can only measure what people express to us. Um, and through that expression, uh, whether that seems to be something that might be called racist or not. I think if there's something deeper that people aren't aware of, um, that's something else. But, uh, you know, we, we didn't ask anybody on the survey if they were a racist. Um, that wouldn't work very well. I think that we can gain some insight from responses to some of these questions to determine the extent to which uh, some of these might be considered racist sentiments. So others may have had that question as well. Thank, thank you very much for that, Keith. And one last question that I see has come in, which is, uh, in terms of the uh, the span of the data collection, uh, mm -hmm. was it just in 2019, or was data collected over a longer period of time? Uh, it was collected over uh, two weeks or so in the spring, I believe in April and May of 2019. It was in the deck, and it's in the report if anybody is interested with those details. Great. Keith, again, thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, uh, to share this information with us and. Thanks to uh, those people who took time out of their day uh, to attend this webinar. Uh, our next webinar will be taking place in John January the 27th, I believe, uh, which and it will be uh, focusing on uh, International Holocaust uh, Remembrance, uh, and we'll be featuring a presenter from the Center for Israel and Jewish Affairs. So please continue to attend these webinars, uh, and uh, we thank you all for your time. Thank you, Keith. Thank you all for, uh, for attending. Take care.